Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. This is a special live stream that we are doing um, around the um, breaking uh, ex uh, verdict on the Julian Assange case, on the extradition case. And it's kind of perfect timing because this week we were going to have our esteemed guest who's on with us right now, um, Dr. Nils Melzer, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. Um, and we decided that instead of taping it earlier this week or yesterday, we were going to do it live because of the timing. And so we're really honored to have um, to have you with us, um, sir. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much for having me. Um, could you just set up today's breaking news, what happened, and then we can get into the significance, but just the technical legalities of it? Yes, and, and I mean, really, a few terms just uh, since 2019, so roughly two and a half years, uh, Julian Assange ha has been in detention in a British, British high uh, security prison after having been expelled from the Ecuadorian embassy where he had spent another seven years before. And on that day when he was arrested, the U.S. made an extradition request uh, that was amended several times, uh, but basically covers 18 charges. Uh, 17 of which are espionage charges and one is a, a so-called hacking charge. So what's going on in the last two years is an extradition proceeding by the U.S. asking for Assange's extradition from the U.K. And what we've had in January this year, so almost a year ago, is the first instance decision um, which basically confirmed the legitimacy of the U.S.'s attempt to criminalize what Julian Assange has done in publishing uh, secret national security information that you know, proves, uh, you know, torture, war crimes, and and corruption, um, and, and basically is really in the public interest and is very problematic because it's just a basic form of investigative journalism. So the U.S. trying to criminalize that under the Espionage Act, the British court in the first instance confirmed that being legitimate. The only reason they refused, uh, for the time being, at the time, uh, Julian Assange's extradition was his medical state of health, and that they said the U.S. prison conditions would be oppressive given his mental uh, state of health. Now, what has happened today is that the appeals court, the U.S. has then appealed that decision, um, and, and the, the U.S. has now won that appeal. The appeals court has confirmed that, in fact, the U.S. has uh, should have been given an opportunity to, to give guarantees regarding the treatment of Julian Assange, which the U.S. has done in the meantime, and given those guarantees, the appeals court in the UK has uh, determined that Julian Assange can be extradited to the uh, to the US. So, what's the chronology of what happens from here? Well, it's it's difficult to predict with you know any form of precision, but there's still some legal remedies that that remain. There is a Supreme Court in the UK, just as there is in the US, the third instance court, which can or cannot, you can decline to hear an appeal or can accept to hear an appeal. Hear an appeal. But uh, given the issues that are at stake, which basically is, are the US guarantees sufficient or not, or are they credible or not, it's very unlikely for the Supreme Court in the UK to say, oh, that's all nice, but we don't believe the U.S., right? Because the U.S. still is a rule of law country, so democracy is a close ally. So if, if the U.S. government makes a, makes a solemn you know, commitment to give certain guarantees, the, US, uh, the U.K. government and its courts are, are bound to believe, to believe them. Uh, the, but, the only, the only, excuse me, the only no. re legal remedy that has some prospect of success, in my view, is the final appeal. Once all of the remedies in the UK have been exhausted, they can still try to go to the European Court of Human Rights. It's an international court based in France and Strasbourg that could then still block that extradition. Is there a way to look at this as not bad news? In other words. Oh, yeah. uh, in other words, he was going to linger in British prison for as long as this question remained unresolved. Uh, and really, his only hope at this point is to be acquitted in, in an American court. Um, so is there a way of looking at it that, yes, this is terrible that they made this decision? We would, we, we would obviously like uh, for the British to step up and refuse this extradition request. Um, but given that that was not likely to happen, I mean, is it is, is there a way to look at this as, well, it's time to prepare for the actual trial and maybe that maybe that's, there's some hope there. Honestly, I don't think so because I don't see any way that Julian Assange would be, you know, prosecuted and 
pursued by the US government, investing tens of millions of dollars for a decade, and then to get him all the way over to the US just to acquit him. I mean, they're not going to do that. I mean, and, and you know, I, I know this sounds strange because they're thinking, well, this is, a, this is the, you know, the independent decision of a court. But everything I've seen investigating this case, you know, for over the past decade, in, in no court of law have, have the, uh, the procedural rights and the human rights, the basic constitutional rights of due process of Julian Assange ever been respected. It's been systematically violated at every stage of every proceeding in every jurisdiction because all those governments, they're colluding, they're, they have the same interests, uh, which is to, to set an example uh, threatening other journalists, you know, such as yourselves. You know, if you ever get a USB stick. If I gave you a USB, I don't have one, just to make that clear. <laughs> if I had a USB stick with collateral murder video number two, and the next 250,000 diplomatic cables proving war crimes and, and torture and corruption, would you publish that? I seriously doubt it. If you will look at his, at his example, whether he's extradited or not, already now, you would say, well, you know, you'd ask yourself some serious questions. And that's precisely what they want. Instill that sense of insecurity that you can't rely on press freedom when you have secret information that proves serious government misconduct and is in the, in the clear in the, publicly, uh, the public interest to, to publish that you don't feel free and protected by your constitution and by human rights to actually publish that. Isn't it actually you, worse than that? Uh, I'm sorry to get Katie. It's like, no, no, keep going. It, it's not even a question of whether or not to publish. Like, you can't even have that conversation according to the to the the, the charges that, that have been filed against him. Isn't that right? I mean, in other words, it's no, exactly. a, a, acquiring the information at all, whether or not you publish. Yeah. Yeah, because because the, the broader public is not even aware what what the charges are. When you look at the charges, there is no thing of you know having yeah. harmed anybody or anybody having been seriously endangered. Because the U.S. government has not been able to prove a single case of everybody anyone having been endangered. It only says you know he's charged of having obtained and published secret national security information. But he's not American. He's never worked in the U.S. He didn't uh, he'd work for the U.S. He had no uh, obligation of non-disclosure. He was just a ordinary international journalist, and he received that information from whistleblowers. And that's a different story because they had a, you know, a non-disclosure agreement, and, and there are other issues there that we could discuss. But he is really not even a whistleblower. He's just a publisher. And so you're absolutely right. right. So if he asks questions, and, and he's basically accused of having when he asked, do you have more information or something like this, that this would be instigation and conspiracy in espionage, which basically means you can be an investigative journalist as long as you're not asking any questions. Now, try to be a journalist any amount of time without asking questions. Right, right. And uh, go ahead, Katie. I'm sorry. No, no, no. If you want to wrap, I have something slightly different. So if you want to. No, it's just the uh, so. In other words, the, the conspiracy to even ask about na national defense information. Incidentally, what is national defense information? Have they defined it? Is it necessarily classified information? Uh, well, well, is it just, whatever they call it? Whatever they call it, whatever they choose, whatever they don't want the public to know, they can classify. And we know that there is a notorious tendency of overclassification. Right. Uh, and so clearly, when you leave it up to a government to decide on its own, you know, what should be classified or not. Well, the first thing they'll classify is anything that could be compromising their own interests. Right. And even personal private interests and, um, you know, be like being prosecuted for a war crime, you know, or instigating in a war of aggression or, you know, instructing people to to commit torture. All of these types of things, you wouldn't want the public to know if you're the perpetrator. And if the perpetrator is given the power to classify that, it's basically like giving an accused criminal in court the power to classify the evidence against him. And you know, that's not the purpose of secrecy and confidentiality. There is a, there is a legitimate space for diplomatic you know, negotiations in confidence and so on, but does not mean that you can withdraw these things from the rule of law. You know, anybody, that's what the rule of law means, that even, you know, the president of the U.S. or anybody else 
you know, in a powerful position is subject to the law. And so if they can just classify the evidence, it basically means that they gain impunity. And where that leads, you know, is obvious. Right. Can you talk a bit about your own, I mean, so you are the author, not only are you the Special Rapporteur on Torture for the UN, and you have a very significant biography, also a Swiss professor, author, and advocate in international law. You served in various war contexts as legal advisor to the International Committee for the Red Cross and as a security policy advisor to the Swiss government. And you also are the author of this book, um, The Trial of Julian Assange. And, oh yeah, we should do it at the same time. Matt, do it again. Hold All on. Right, there we go. I have it also. <laughs> yeah. So okay. um, you're, you describe in this, in this book how you, and I think this is a really important thing to reach people who aren't already necessarily here, but you yourself was someone who was, you were turned off by, by Julian Assange. You talk yeah. about overcoming your own prejudice. Can you right. talk about that process, how you went from someone who actually ignored the pleas of his legal team to someone who turned into uh, a champion uh, for his legal yeah. rights? And human rights? Yeah, I, yeah. Thanks for the question because that's really one of the most troubling aspects of the story for for me, uh, you know, as a human rights expert. So, I, I have this mandate, which basically is my job is to, you know, or by my mandate from the United Nations is to, to, uh, to oversee the implementation, to respect for the the, the provision of torture and ill treatment in all UN member states, and to to also investigate individual cases. Um, and so I receive, you know, uh, requests for interventions by, by torture victims and their relatives and lawyers every day, about 10 to 15 requests. And so one of those requests I received in December 2018, Assange at that point was still in the embassy uh, in London, uh, I uh, was by his lawyers and they, 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 they basically complained that his living conditions in the Ecuadorian embassy had turned inhumane and they wanted me to intervene on his behalf. And I just... I just remember this visually. I was sitting on my computer and writing a report for the UN on corruption, political corruption, strikingly, and, and the provision of torture. And I see this little message flagging coming in my screen saying, you know, new message coming in. Uh, and, and the title was Julian Assange's lawyers are asking for your protection. And I immediately had this visceral reaction of like, no, not this one. I kind of swiped it off my screen and look out of my eyes, you know, out of my mind, because I had this, this image of, oh, this is this hacker, rapist, you know, traitor, hiding somewhere in an embassy because he doesn't want to stand justice and so on. And he's just going to manipulate me. So I just kind of had this emotional reaction. Now, it's normal for me that I have to, you know, select quickly. I can only pursue one case per day and I receive, you know, 10 to 15 requests but in his case, it was particularly emotional. I had these negative emotions. And then uh, his lawyers came back about three months later, uh, shortly before he was expelled, saying that there were these rumors he would be expelled uh, in, in, you know, uh, imminently and sent to the US where you know, inhumane uh, uh, treatment and, uh, would, would be awaiting him. And so they also sent me some pieces of evidence, some medical opinions by independent doctors and and when I read those pieces, I realized that, well, this guy already applied about three months ago. And I asked myself, why, why didn't I actually deal with this case before? And I started becoming conscious of my prejudice. And I asked myself, well, wh where do I have these images from? These, you know, these, the certainty that this is a bad guy, this is a traitor, this is a rapist, and so on. And I realized that I, I, I had been, had absorbed this basically from, public reporting over a decade, almost passively, unconsciously. And that's, that really scared me because I thought, well, my mandate is to, to see through these types of smokescreen. And if I, as a professional with, you know, 25 years of experience in some of the worst war areas and so on, if I can't see through the most smokescreen, um, well, so what the average person who never even dealt with human rights, you know, what, what are they going to do? And, and so I, I felt like I, I owed it to my professional and personal integrity to at least look into this case. And so I decided to actually go and visit him in London. And I first wanted to visit him in the embassy. When I announced it, I think they got cold feet at the UK government and the Ecuadorians. So within three days, they expelled him in a very hasty uh, uh, you know, uh, approach um, to make sure that to kind of to establish the facts on the ground. I think 
I'm, my announcement that I wanted to come and visit him may have accelerated it. I, knew, I know for a fact, and today we have the evidence that this had been planned for months ahead, but, uh, that, but they were speeding up the process when I announced my intention to visit. So I got to visit him, but only once he had been uh, arrested by the British and was already in Belmarsh Prison in London in May, the 9th of May, 2019. How, how damaging was the DNC leak to uh, Assange's ability to rally sort of establishment liberals to his cause? You talk about this a little bit in your book. Did you notice a change in the way that people dealt with you, dealt with him? Uh, you know. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I got involved only after this. But when I investigated the case, I saw that that the way he was perceived in the public changed dramatically after the DNC leaks. But especially uh, the way that the DNC leak story had been, had been told by the Democratic Party, right? Because clearly the Democratic Party had a big interest in kind of making, making all those you know, problems disappear that had come up to the surface through those leaks. And so they had a, a vested interest in, in changing the narrative and finding, finding someone else to blame. And so very, very quickly, the story came up, of, oh, this is like a, you know, a Russian conspiracy with uh, Assange at the center, and uh, he wanted to help Trump into office. And, uh, and, and, and so basically, he was scapegoated for Trump's election victory. And, uh, and, and, and that was obviously a convenient scapegoat for people you not know, having to ask themselves, well, you know, how exactly did the Democratic Party actually lose support? to such an extent that someone like Trump could be elected. But um, so, so this and, and this whole narrative of Assange wanted to harm the US by supporting Trump and collaborating with the Russians, none of which is proven, by the way, um, that has really harmed uh, him and, and, and obviously has, has, has diminished and weakened his support base in the U.S. Similarly, as the, 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 those rape allegations, the Swedish rape allegations have have clearly, um, you know, destroyed much of his support base here in, in, in Europe. And here again, you know, there has, there's no evidence whatsoever. I mean, the, the Swedish authorities have pushed this narrative for nine years uh, aggressively in public and always claimed that the only reason they're not uh, trying him and imprisoning him for rape is because he's hiding in the embassy as soon as he was arrested and was at the disposal of the Swedish, they, they still had one and a half years before those charges or those accusations expired. Um, they closed the proceeding saying that they don't have enough evidence not to convict him, but not even to charge him. They didn't have sufficient, and they pushed a rape narrative for 10 years, basically, and didn't have enough evidence to even press charges against him. And so what we see is all of those things that people think, so, those boxes, he's a rapist. Actually, there's no evidence even to charge him. Um, and, and there's actually contrary evidence as well, but we can talk about this if you want. And then the DNC stuff, well, he's not even charged for a crime in that relation because uh, that case was actually thrown out by a New York federal judge, a New York City judge, a Southern District judge in, uh, in, in, in summer 2019, saying that you know everything he's done was protected by press freedom. And a Clinton-appointed judge, by the way. Wow. Yeah, so that was quite that was quite impressive, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so the the Democratic Party there really, you know, lost a very important case, um, and and then this question of him be a traitor. Well, how can you be a traitor if you're not an American? <laughs> uh, how can you be a traitor to America if you're not American? Uh, you're not working for the Americans. You're not in America. Yeah, use uh, you that have... smear for Snowden and and um, Manning. That's who you should smear as traitors if you need to. If, if, I feel like you're you... overestimating the intelligence of the yeah, American good, public right. if if you think we make these distinctions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you, you know, the, the thing is, I had this impression, you know, myself, and I haven't even reflected it. The thing is, we're, we're, we're not aware of how much of our prejudice uh, we're just absorbing unconsciously yeah. because we, you know, we just have a limited capacity of dealing with issues and we have kids and we have, you know, pets and we have jobs and we have houses and, and sports clubs and whatever. And, and, then, and then we have the news and then we have all those stories. And 
And so we, we, we're all looking for simple solutions just to simplify our daily lives. And that's, I, you know, I'm not, I don't even want to judge people who do that because we all do right. that. But we, the, the important point is that we're aware of it and that we're prepared to question our prejudice. That's what's important, you know. Yeah, I still get people saying to me even now, well, he released confidential information that put people's lives in danger, didn't curate it, and he helped Trump get elected. Um, and I re remind them that, that that's not actually what he's being um, punished for. But what, what no. is your response to those points? Well, first of all, uh, yes, he did re release, you know, uh, confidential information, but so did, you know, Ellsberg, uh, so right. did all those whistleblowers that are protected under, so do all the New York Times. Right. I mean, they all okay. co-released co this information right. with him. They actually, you know, selected it with him and so on. So that's the job. That's what journalists do. They, they publish, you know, information. And, you know, if, if the, if it's secret information that's in the public interest that proves government misconduct, hey, that's actually the, the core role of the media. I think what people have forgotten today is that the role of the media is not to entertain you, it's to empower you. They're called the, the fourth estate. That's the fourth power after the government, the parliament or the Congress or whatever, and, and the judiciary, you have the press, they're overseeing how those other three powers are working. And when they, when there's misconduct, they inform the public so that democratically, you know, the, the, the base of the country, the people can actually take their, use their democratic rights to correct it. That's the role of the media. And that's exactly what Julian Assange and WikiLeaks have done. And, and so I, I think it's very important that we're aware, that we're asking ourselves, why exactly is he in prison? What exactly did he do wrong? And then, if they say, well, he helped Trump being elected. Well, okay, I'm not a friend of Trump's because he, he wanted to bring back torture. Remember, he, he said, like, I'm going to bring back waterboarding and much worse. I mean, how can I in my function be supportive of Trump? I'm not. But I just observed that he was an official candidate for the presidential election 2016. And half of the country voted for him. I mean, are they all criminals because they vote? They supported him? No, I, you know, I, I, that's the point of an election. You're supporting one candidate and he, he didn't even have a vote. I mean, Assange didn't have a vote, but a, any journalist has the right to prefer one of the candidates. I'm not even saying that he did, but I right. say, even if he did, well, so what's wrong with that? You know, if, if you put up this person as a legitimate candidate, well, you know, then guess what? He can be elected and some people can prefer him over the other. There is no entitlement of the political establishment like Hillary Clinton to be elected. You know, I, and again, I'm not defending the election of Trump. I'm just saying this is just what an election is. Someone will win, someone will lose. Some people prefer this one, some people prefer the other. And if a journalist finds dirty information and, you know, that's true about one of the candidates, well, their function is to inform the public. And did they find dirty information that's true about the Democratic Party? Well, they did. And they published it. And it's true information. So, you know, I, why would that be a, a crime? And, and, and so I think we really have to carefully think about wh why we're punishing people. You, you know, is it, is, is, it's uncomfortable to have had a president like, like Donald Trump. But maybe the question is, how come the established parties have lost so much support in the general population? What have they done wrong if, if the country cannot come up with a better candidate than Donald Trump? You know, I mean, what, where's the problem? It's not Julian Assange who's the problem. He hasn't elected him. He has not even a vote. Him, he's an Australian, you know. And, and so I think it's very important that we keep our kind of straight mind. Also, when we're talking about, uh, you know, this person is being pursued for having published confidential information that hasn't harmed anybody. There's no evidence at all. Maybe it could have, theoretically, but it, there's no evidence that it did. But the information he published is in, I mean, it's uncontroversial evidence, hard evidence, that serious crime have been committed by the government. Torture, war crimes, I mean, horrible stuff by the thousands. And who has been prosecuted for that? Nobody. So we have evidence for serious crimes, but nobody is being prosecuted. So the criminals walk free. 
But the, the person, the witness in court, basically, who brings the evidence, who tells everybody, hey, these are the criminals, here's the evidence, he's being prosecuted for bringing the evidence? I mean, doesn't that turn our basic notion of justice upside down? You know, and, and I'm not saying Americans are war criminals. I'm just saying the American armed forces, just like any other armed force, when they engage in war, some people will commit war crimes. That's just the way it is, right? I mean, it's that's just because human beings are like this, and that's why we need courts to deal with it. And and here I really feel that's so so scandalous about this case that telling the truth about crime becomes criminalized while committing crimes, you know, we enjoy impunity. Yeah. And for those people just t tuning in, um, we should just remind people that the, today the English court uh, um, uh, decided that Assange will be extradited to the United States. Yes, they have, exactly. So the, the high court in the UK today has decided that he has overturned the first instance decision that he cannot and has confirmed that he can now be extradited to the, to the US. Speaking of the UK, I was wondering if you could, you could comment on their role in this whole proceeding. Um, how, how well or not did they uphold the international standards in their treatment of him? in their, you know, I, I know you mentioned in the book the delays in, with visitation and, and other issues. Can you speak a little bit to uh, what happened to Assange while he was in, you know, yeah. behind bars in England? Yeah, yeah that, that's one of the most shocking observations I made because I'm also a professor at the British University. And so I, I'm very proud of the British, you know, tradition of rule of law and democracy and so on. And, um, and the separation of power and all of those democratic principles. So, so when he was arrested, I thought like, yeah, maybe, you know, when before, when, before I visited him in prison, I thought, well, okay, maybe he's not well, we'll make a medical assessment and then we'll make some recommendations to the UK. But the UK is a democracy, it's a rule of law country. I'm sure, you know, they will give him a fair proceeding and he won't be extradited to the US because it's obvious that the prison conditions he would be exposed to are inhumane and unacceptable from a human rights perspective. So I was really shocked to see that the day he was arrested, they immediately brought him to trial, uh, not, not for a, a, you know, a detention proceeding, but he was actually tried. Uh, he, he had his, his, his trial on the day he was arrested from the embassy for a crime that he was uh, accused of having committed seven years earlier, which is the crime of bail violation when he took uh, asylum in the embassy. And he was convicted on that very day. So, I mean, imagine you've been locked up in an embassy for seven years. You're being pulled out uh, without advance notice, no proceeding, no rule of law proceeding, no defense, nothing. You're being pulled out of that embassy. He must be under shock. And he's pushed immediately before a judge and tried and convicted that very day. And the judge insulted him in public court, you know, as being a narcissist, uh, that he has only his, you know, egotistical self-interest in mind. And, but Julian Assange had not said anything during the whole hearing, except I plead not guilty. So on what basis is he, is the judge openly insulting the defendant? I mean, it, it, it displayed a level of bias that, you know, you, you can't do that as a judge. Then the next thing is, as soon as the, the U.S. requested extradition, they appointed a judge to, to actually preside over that proceeding. Um, at that, and that her husband had been exposed by WikiLeaks in 30, 30, more than 30 cases. So, I mean, there's a clear conflict of interest. Uh, you can't do that, you know. And after about, about a couple of months, then she was replaced by, by a different judge. But... That goes Both of on. Them have on. really the, weird last names, neither here nor there. But it's like in order to see to oversee this case, you have to have a very hard to pronounce last name. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. yes, absolutely, yeah. So and and then, but then also, what happened is that he was in extradition detention. This is not. I mean, he's not serving a sentence. He is actually just being secured. So in case the U.S. wins his extradition case after a couple of years, he's not. You know taking asylum somewhere or escaping otherwise. But you don't put someone who's nonviolent, who's not serving a sentence in the, you know, the toughest high security prison of the country in Belmarsh, which is called the, the Guantanamo of Britain, uh, you know, where he 
is basically, you know, in, in danger inside the prison. I mean, he he has to be isolated because he's together with, you know, heavy criminals. So so why why would they do that? You know, because uh, if you look at another extradition trial that that happened in the UK was Augusto Pinochet, the, the previous dictator of Chile, who had been accused of crimes against humanity, torture, murder, I mean, serious stuff, not journalism. But he was not put in prison during the extradition proceeding. For one and a half years, he was, you know, being accommodated in a, in a noble villa, villa. He was visited by Margaret Thatcher. And, and so, so you can, again, you can see someone who has been accused of real serious mass crimes. He's being treated like a gentleman. And Julian Assange, who is nonviolent and who has only committed, committed, I mean, conducted journalism, he's being isolated to an extent that it was impossible for him to have sufficient contact with his lawyers to prepare his defense. Because he was exposed to a Swedish proceeding, to an extradition proceeding by the, U uh, the US, to a bail violation proceeding by the UK, and also a Ecuadorian proceeding regarding his belongings that had been confiscated in the, in the embassy when he was arrested and just handed over to the US without any uh, rule of law considerations. So all of this, I mean, you can't handle that from an isolation cell, um, uh, you know, with five minute phone calls with your lawyer, you have to sit down with a lawyer and, and there is no legal basis to keep him in a high security prison. All they can do is really house arrest. But again, all of this, I mean, consistently, you can see that, that his uh, due process rights are being violated at, at every stage of every proceeding he's ever been exposed to. And, and, and no legal remedy ever works in his favor. And, you know, mistakes can happen even in the, the most perfect democracy and rule of law country. Courts make mistakes. We're all human, right? But that's why we have superior instances that can then correct that. That never happens in his case. It's always, they always find some kind of an excuse of why his rights don't apply in this case. And, you know, there's, a, there's an extradition treaty between the UK and the US, and there isn't a provision in that treaty that explicitly prohibits the extradition for political offenses. Now, what's the quintessential political offense in law school is espionage. That's the example. As always, the political offense, you can never extradite someone for espionage. And the UK and the US agreed in their treaty that that's prohibited. And now, you know, it was, it was a no brainer for his defense team to say, here's the treaty, it prohibits this extradition, you can't extradite him for espionage charges. So now the, the judge comes and says, oh yeah, but this treaty is not part of British law. It's actually international law because it's a treaty between the US and the UK. And I, as a British judge, can only apply English law. And, and it's some kind of a weird, nonsensical argument. You know, it's, it's what I call juridical acrobacy to basically come to an absurd conclusion that a treaty concluded between the US and the UK government doesn't apply between the US and the UK government in this case. I, I mean, it's, 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 it's grotesque. And this, this we can see throughout this proceeding, these types of weird uh, interpretations uh, uh, of, you know, when, when they have an international treaty where the English text would prohibit Assange's um, Assange's extradition, they actually go and look at the French translation, whether they can there pick <laughs> a word that you can interpret differently in French than in English, and then they translate it back differently into English than is written in the, in the English version, and then they apply that to this case. Seriously, I mean, this is the type of things they do. And because you have it, to admire the creativity yeah, of that. Yeah, exactly, right, yeah. But it's, but it's, it's grotesque. It's grotesque, and 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 they do this with a straight face, you see. And that's. Uh... Are you surprised at all by the um, the kind of disinterest in the case uh, among sort of the American press? Like, I I get that people, a lot of American reporters, don't like Julian Assange, but the inability to see the uh, the consequences of this case for them personally going forward uh, does that surprise you at all i mean it it surprises me a little bit well it did it did surprise me in the beginning by now 
you know, I've, <laughs> I'm used to it, but I, I felt like, look, this, hey guys, this is about your rights. I mean, it's about, it's really about you. It's not even about us. I mean, yes, it's a, about Assange for Assange and his family, but that's a, a few people in the world. For all the rest of us, it's about you and your rights and your kids, you know? I mean, seriously, if this becomes, if telling the truth becomes a crime, I mean, what kind of world are we living in? You know, I mean, what are we going to tell our children? You know, don't tell the truth because it's, it's a crime. You know, if, if you see something bad happening, you know, just lie about it and pretend everything's okay because otherwise you're the bad guy. I mean, what kind of world are we going to live in? It's really weird. Um, I, I suspect, though, also that if you, if you look at the truth of the Assange case, I mean, it's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, it's like a keyhole to look into a parallel universe where we see into the reality of how international relations are really being conducted. And, and once you start realizing this, things become really complicated because it's not just, oh, this is the bad guy, this is the hacker, this is the traitor, this is the rapist. So we have to scapegoat. He, he helped Trump become the president so we don't have to ask uncomfortable questions about ourselves. So, so what do we do? I mean, how do, how do we correct the reality as it is that basically governments do as they please and give themselves impunity through their classification and secrecy system and, and, and they, they persecute anybody who threatens this? So how exactly are we going to change that? You know, that? That becomes complicated. Also, how are people who claim to hate Trump and hate Assange because of how much uh, he allegedly helped Trump, I don't understand how they're not upset that Joe Biden is now siding with Donald Trump over Obama because Obama stopped. He knew that, that there was the New York Times problem, right? That if he went after Julian Assange, he'd ultimately have to say, well, if it's so bad to publish that, then it was bad for the New York Times too, right? So he kind of puts the brakes on. Then we get Trump in, and he and Pompeo go and go full full court press, yeah. full court press, right? And now all these people who call Trump Cheeto Mussolini are siding with Biden, who is siding with Trump. And why is Biden siding with Trump over Obama? And can he be shamed? Like, what what is to be? What can be done now? Because you are a very, your background, you're a very objective person and you describe in your book how you become kind of an activist. Yeah. You're forced into that because no, and even your book is part of your activism because no one is paying attention. So uh, what can be done? Can can anyone be shamed into not being Trumpian? Um, is the, is the are we supposed to pressure the, uh, the international court you were referring to? Should Britain be pressured? What should be done for those activists out there who want to save this man's life? Well, first of all, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not even an Assange activist. I'm just an activist for justice and the rule of law. I mean, it's very basic stuff. Yes. You know? and, yeah. And press freedom. I mean, and, and so, um, yeah, well, I think the truth is, you know, Obama is often idealized, you know, but in fact, I mean, he, he was the one who was relentless in persecuting whistleblowers yeah. and he is the one I who know. decided right. not to prosecute anybody for torture and all those war crimes right. exactly. he, he, he tortured I mean, some folks yeah we tortured some folks right i yeah. mean seriously and, and and you know yeah even in the war crimes tribunals that the americans helped establish for yugoslavia and rwanda and everything and and nuremberg and tokyo you know the u.s pushed for a rule that that said that a commander or another a civilian superior or a military commander who who prevents the prosecution of his subordinates for war crimes becomes a war criminal himself. That's a rule that was pushed by the US at, in all those war crimes tribunals. Well, that's exactly what, what Obama has done. So I think we, we have to be quite realistic that Obama decided not to prosecute Assange at the time because he didn't know how, but also he didn't, he didn't pardon him. Right. You know, no, never, of course. He, yeah. Exactly. And, and he, also, so he, he also used the Espionage Act like thirteen yeah, and times. and he was a, bi to, and a big droning yeah. fan. And and so I'm I'm more saying this because I think it. I, I I'm not a huge Obama fan at all, but it, to yeah. me it's just a shocking hypocrisy and shows how thin the rhetoric is. Like you, this is of your course. guy, people. This is the constitutional law professor who you love because he's an intellectual. He's not yeah. Cheeto Mussolini, and yet yeah. this route is the Cheeto Mussolini route trying to wake up the blue blue check that, libs out there. Absolutely. Well, well, I think, you know, they're just as reliant, uh, you know, any, any administration, I guess, since Kennedy or so has been 
so much reliant on their on, on the CIA and, and the intelligence community and their interests. I think Biden, you know, he, he plays that same game. I mean, he, he, I don't think he can afford, you know, politically to to let Assange off the hook, you know, because, well, there's Hillary Clinton who probably won't forgive him. Um, and I, 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 you're about a better place to analyze, the, you know, the, the American environment. But I, I think the only fair solution for Assange and for all of us, frankly, is for the Biden administration to drop this case and to admit that publishing secret information that proves serious crime is in the public interest of the American people and the world public, because we don't want people who have committed serious crimes walking around freely. You know, nobody, why should rapists and torturers and murderers walk around freely? You know, I mean, we, we don't want these types of things. And that, that's, that also gives the legitimacy to a government and to the armed forces and the police forces and the CIA and so on, if their criminals are being prosecuted and filtered out. But if that, not, that no longer happens, you know, what does the U.S. then stand for? What does the Biden administration stand for when he persecutes this man who is too frail to even attend his appeals hearing in the U.K.? I mean, he, he couldn't even through video link stay concentrated long enough to watch that hearing. And he's a very intelligent man. He was so strongly medicated for his medical state of health that he couldn't even follow those proceedings. How can we even discuss to extradite him to the US where a mammoth proceeding in Alexandria at the espionage court is awaiting him? I mean, and, and without the support of his family, I mean, that's just a humanitarian bit. And then the question, and why again is he in the prison in the first place? Because he's a journalist? I mean, seriously, he's an inconvenient truth teller. But what's inconvenient really is not he, it's the truth. You know, so so let's deal with it, you know. Mm, unbelievable. Um, Katie, we should, we should let him go probably, okay. right? Yeah. Yeah. Or, uh, any or other perhaps questions? maybe one I more question. Say... Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, one more question is this is really scary because you write in your book that you visit. So so spoiler alert. Um, um, our guest goes to visit Assange, determines he's been tortured. And that is your lane. You're an expert in that. So. He, you are the special repertoire on torture, um, and you are reluctant to look into this. So you had no skin in the game to determine that. You go visit him, and um, as you're leaving, he says, please save my life. And then you write, during our conversation, he had made it absolutely clear that he would not be extradited to the United States alive. In view of what awaited him there, this was a rational decision, he had said. And so the decision of the British court was that because of this, right? They're basically saying it wouldn't be safe. Then the U.S. appeals and says, "No, we'll make these these assurances, which are not assurances, because he still could be put in in solitary, right?" So, can you just kind of leave us with what uh, a guide? Uh, because this is so urgent, and this is a man's life. What what do you want people to do? Well, I, I look. I just want people to to look in the mirror and say, "What did I do to prevent this from happening?" when I still could. Could I write to my, you know, representative in, in Congress? Could I, you know, talk to the journalists, and, you know, that I know to cover the story, to bring out the truth, to, to actually tell the public what this is about? You know, this, this has to be stopped because yes, it's about Assange and I'm convinced that he will find a way of committing suicide to prevent his extradition to the US. And frankly, I understand because he's not getting a, a he's not gonna get a fair trial at a secret, court in Alexandria, you know, where no one has ever been acquitted and no one even knows what the evidence is because it's all classified. Seriously. I mean, is that a fair trial? No, that's what we hear from, you know, authoritarian states. I mean, seriously, how much worth is your right to know about what your government is doing with the power you give to it when you elect it and the money you give to it through your taxes? How much worth is to you your right to know what they're doing with that power and the money. If you think it should become a crime for you to ask questions about what they're doing uh, in secret, well, you know, <laughs> that's what we're, this is the world that's, that's awaiting us. So this is really, really urgent because once it has become a crime to tell the truth, as I always say, we live in a tyranny. It's gonna be too late. 
And this is why I've written uh, this book because I've, I've, you know, I've just but like a whistleblower, I've used all the official channels of my mandate, diplomatic channels, intervened with the foreign ministers of the involved countries and informed the General Assembly of the UN in New York and the Human Rights Council in Geneva. It didn't work. I decided I have to write a book because I don't want my children to live in a world where it has become a crime to, say, to tell the truth. And that's just the last resort I had to inform the public. And I really encourage people to read this and to draw their own consequences. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, Thank every, so every absolutely everybody should read uh, yeah. should read the trial of Julian Assange. And um, you know, if there's a, I, I can't even think of what to do. Write your congressman, but but this this is a this is a really dark day. Um, yeah. Matt, what you're doing now I, is exactly what you should be doing because that's a, you, you you're now interviewing me and you're spreading the truth about this case. That's exactly what you should be doing. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. No, yeah well, thank, thank you. you so thank much. you for coming on. We'll we'll do everything we can. And uh, good yeah. good luck to you. Thanks. Yeah. And thanks, thank Katie. You so thanks, much. Matt. All thanks the best so to you. Yeah. You, you take too. care. Sure. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Oh my God. It is such a uh yeah, it's such a shit show. It's so terrible. Uh, uh you I, know, I feel I, so I, bad I, for his family. Well, I mean, look, the, the, I'm sort of beyond the worrying Surprise. about Julian Assange oh. stage, like, and and well, I'm farther down the road of uh, free press. Well, no, it's just the the fact that people don't have they have zero reaction to this clearly third world maneuver happening, like completely out in the open and um, without really any kind of formal opposition by any political figures in the United States. Um, it's, it's shocking, you know, I mean, we, you know, you can go and watch the, the, you know, the, the hit uh, dramatization of the trial of the Chicago seven and everyone, everyone gapes at the scene where you know bobby seal has his mouth shackled, taped, yeah. yeah and they're shackled in court and everything like that oh my god can you believe they did that back then like this is this is a thousand times worse than that um the you know the, as, as nils mentioned there's there's no real underlying crime uh that makes any sense at all although unfortunately according to the way this law is written he's he's guilty because everyone's guilty according to yeah. this law um so it's essentially this is going to be a demonstration of the united of the american government's ability to put anybody they want in jail forever uh for saying the wrong thing and like if you're not freaked out by that uh you know i i don't know what to tell you like you know, you don't have to care about Julian Assange right. to, to, to recognize um, how completely fucked up that is and, and, and that we've we've crossed a Rubicon uh, with this moment. Yes, in fact. And yeah, and it's funny because Nils himself talks about crossing the Rubicon. And uh, I think the Rubicon is is figuring out what is it? It's actually stating publicly um, that. What is it? He wrote in his letter, uh, in 20 years of work with victims of war, uh, violence and political persecution, I've never seen a group of democratic states ganging up to deliberately isolate, demonize and abuse, abuse a single individual for such a long time and with so, with so little regard for human dignity and the rule of law. Um, he describes that statement as crossing a Rubicon. And he says that until that moment, uh, I had never been a man of the limelight. Exposing myself in this way made me feel very uncomfortable and triggered a full-blown personal crisis. In doing so, I both outwardly and inwardly broke with my residual trust in the system, with my trust in Western democracies as states governed by the rule of law. Which I could have told him earlier to break with that trust. Should have come to me. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, look, the, la the last 20 years have been kind of a continual process of being disillusioned and shocked yeah. by, you know, if you grew up in the United States watching sc Schoolhouse Rock, and I, I have a lot of faith in, like, certain things, and, you know, and, and the ability of the United States to function at a level that's kind of 
um, you know, it has functioned in, in, a, in, in a pretty civilized way, uh, you know, relative to, you know, some other places in the world for a long time. But the last 20 years have been a nightmare, even compared to its own past record. And we've continually gone past these moments where people just sort of shrug and they don't pay attention. Like, you know, I think back at, remember the Jose Padilla case? Yeah, that was the first guy. Who, it was the first American who was sort of just arrested without charge and just and whisked away to a. I think it was like a navy base somewhere, and you know, they just decided that well, we're going to start doing things differently. We don't. You don't have to have a formal charge anymore. We like we don't. <laughs> we're just going to just start taking people off the streets and right. stuffing them on navy bases. And then, and then there was after that there was the. Um, uh, there was the the moment when uh, Obama greenlit the the droning of um, what's his name, the son of uh, of, of the um, you know the the American born Al Qaeda uh, operative. Um, I'm, I'm blanking I on his name right name now. Either, yeah, yeah, but uh, but anyway, him and his son, his 16 year old right, son, son. Yeah. and and the the thing about that was like. The, uh, the unique part was this was a United States citizen. How lucky. Who, yeah. How well, lucky. Right. God, my God, I can't believe I didn't remember this. Shout so, out to all the people who put in the comments. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, we, we sort of steamroll past this idea of, oh, well, the American government can just execute some, like an American citizen without trial. It doesn't, you know, the people shrugged because, oh, he's an Al Qaeda person. So whatever. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, but this is this is like even level levels beyond that nuts. This guy, this guy Assange, isn't even a United States citizen, um, and what he did, you know, like the the ostensible crime is something that basically every journalist in the country does at least a dozen okay. times in his or her career, you know, um, and so. Uh, I, I just I'm, I'm kind of without words at, at this point. I, yeah. Yeah, it's you know you want to get ang you want to be without words. Can we play a, sh a clip from Morning Joe, your friend oh friend of show Morning Joe? Trigger oh, warning, no, please. Oh no, we gotta do it. Oh, yeah, Joe. all right, let's play. Uh, there, there, there is a lot. Of, so this of... is Morning Joe. This is Joe Scarborough, a former Republican congressman, um, and loser um, Missouri senator uh, Claire McCaskill. Uh, there, there, there is a lot of, of smoke surrounding Julian Assange. Of course, there were the charges in, in Sweden that were subsequently dropped. There uh, is the, the hacking uh, and, and his vendetta against Hillary Clinton. Uh, there is information uh, that was released that showed uh, military malfeasance uh, by the United States. Uh, War but, crime. you know, it, it, it's so interesting that it used to be uh, the far left who opposed George W. Bush's wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, who made this guy a hero uh, under the guise of the First Amendment. And, and then when he started leaking information against Hillary Clinton, uh, it became the Trump right that suddenly held Julian aside. So, but let's just forget the politics of this. As a prosecutor, you're given this case and you've got a guy who's stolen thousands of documents, uh, high, uh, pages of highly classified national security documents, release them to the world, uh, and, and in so doing, um, put the lives of U.S. troops, of people who were working with the United States, allies, collaborators in war zones in the gravest of danger uh, under uh, under any scenario. You take politics out of it. And, and this is an open and shut case. This is not the Pentagon Papers. This wasn't Times editors rifling through documents, figuring out what could be released and what couldn't be released and explaining it. This was a guy that got stolen documents and gave it to the world. This is a pretty simple case. It's very straightforward. And the beauty of a trial, Joe, is that you narrow all of the extraneous stuff to the charges that are lot that are there against the defendant. And the charges in this case are that he was trying to hack into 
our military information that protects not just our country, but all the men and women in uniform around the world. This is really serious stuff. Is libel Forget about a thing the politics. Anymore? The fact that both the right and the mm-hmm. left don't like you know that. Julia Assange or love Julia Assange, and depending on the circumstances. Oh, no, we got, don't worry. Don't worry, guys. About, that should tell you all you need to know. This is really a guy who just violated the law. And, you know, I kind of laugh. If their fight against extradition is that they're worried about his safety in prison, they really have, have are, don't have perspective on this. There are lots and lots of people who go to federal prison who have done really worse things. Uh, than Julia Assange, and they are protected in prison. I don't think he needs to worry about whether or not he'll be safe in prison. Um, this is really just a smokescreen to try to keep him from ever being accountable for the rule of law. You know, we started talking about Trump being accountable. This is a really important piece for the American rule of law to get him back to the United States and face oh, these so charges. Now he's Trump. Okay. He could, he could be in an American courtroom soon. Still ahead. That's it's it's important for rule of law, Matt, that we extradite him. This is about caring about American institutions and rule of law. I mean, what didn't he get wrong in that little soliloquy? For first of all, he didn't ha- is, do, do any okay. hacking. He right. he he specifically wasn't the person who stole information. Right, uh, and. Publishing stolen information is legal. There is a Supreme Court case, Bart Nikki v. Vopper, which I'm assuming they both know about, which talks about the, the legality of publishing stolen information, which makes it exactly like, incidentally, the, the Pentagon Papers case. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the other Supreme Court case came after Pentagon Papers, but it relates to the same issue. I mean, this, and then this whole idea of of you know that that they put people in in jeopardy. Uh, we're talking about 2012 now, when they were working with every major news organization in the world, specifically not doing that. By the way, like that was the whole point of the of of that version of WikiLeaks, right? Um, they got every they, they got every element of that story wrong, uh, and it's just, In- they just don't care, including the why he's in harm element, and that shows you just how disgusting of a person Claire McCaskill is. To be fair, so is Joe Scarborough, but I think maybe that's more apparent to some people. But like, you don't uh, even the, follow the of- what the mm-hmm. hell is happening. It's about him committing suicide. And she's acting like this is about him getting shivs, which sure is also a fair thing to worry about. But the whole thing is that it's torture. So and that's and that he's been undergoing torture. He will not get a fair trial. And she's acting like this is such a great day for American justice when a British judge ruled that he was a, a threat to himself, when a rapporteur on torture ruled that he was being tortured. And McGaskill doesn't even know, like she doesn't even have her talking points correct. Like you're talking no, about no, 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 suicide, no. not about getting yeah. murdered. And her dumb. whole, I have to laugh. Yeah. Like, oh, that's the other I have to laugh with the, I have to laugh about suicide. I have to laugh about the complete violation of human rights. I have to laugh about the fact that, by the way, you know, what was so disturbing to me about this book is that the embassy started depriving, this seems maybe not like, like not a big deal, but the embassy took away his shaving kit, which I think is so significant. Because basically they wanted him, when he was going to be dragged out of the embassy, they wanted him to look like a madman. And so he did have that big beard. And I know that maybe shouldn't matter, but optics matter. And I remember, I mean, I was viscerally, I was disgusted by it. But he did look like a kind of a a madman. And that was all intentional. Like they want, this whole thing has been such a great ick factor, as you refer to it. Such a great hit job and smear job of this guy. And it is so disgusting. And those two people are disgusting. They, they should both be packed in a rocket and shot into the sun. Honestly. I'm glad you said that because I didn't want to say anything. But that's too, I feel like that's too comfortable. That's they like should a be, instant they should, be, they should be doused in chum and fed to bears. I mean. That's, I think, uh, a better direction. Now we're going in the better direction, yeah. Komodo dragons, maybe? Komodo First dragons. First, they need to, like, be quizzed on all the things they got wrong. They need I mean, to have all the things that they got wrong explained to them so they know. 
as as the Justice Department source that I that I want I called once to ask why the why the government hadn't interviewed Assange about the Russiagate right. case. Uh, why ask him questions? He'll just lie. So um, that's what he said I, when you asked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So wow. so uh, so I, I think the same thing applies to these two. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I don't want to be like that. Look, as a as a parent, I don't want to hate like. Hating is I don't have. A, I only have Bodhi, so I I'll do I'll do all the hating that you feel is uh but is inappropriate. Man, God, those people also, are just. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg believes in Ju believes that Julian Assange should be free. So you guys pretend to like the Pentagon Papers and Ellsberg. Although we all know you'd be saying the same shit if you oh, were back they, in time. You'd be saying the same exact stuff about Ellsberg and Pentagon Papers. You'd probably support Nixon breaking into his therapist's office. You'd probably love that. What I mean, so that that whole aspect of it, like, look, this is this is the era that put out the movie The Post, you know, yeah. so the sort of the the worshipful uh, biopic about the heroic journalists who 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 stood up for the Constitution right. during the Pentagon Papers episode, and they're the they're the same ones who were like, you know. Uh, basically have a, a an unbroken lineup of uh nsa and langley apologists yeah. uh on their op-ed page and you know and they're owned by jeff bezos who's you know the, one of the biggest intelligence contractors in the country they're they're just absolutely disgusting uh yeah. the, these people and and the, the total lack of backbone among I I just can't get over how how disgusted I am about the the journalism community because um yeah I I get the people who don't like him like I I I have some good friends who who really don't like him for a variety of reasons that have to do you know with the way he comported himself at WikiLeaks the way he treated yeah. some his relationships with some of his employees there the way he, uh, his relationship with uh, Chelsea Manning, like th there's there's stuff, sure. right? If you don't like him, uh, but not there's, death penalty there's... stuff. But it's not even about him. Again, it, this this is this is about like this is about the precedent of what they can do to anybody who publishes or even has a conversation, and it's just nobody cares. Because they, they, there's this reflexive thing now. Oh, well, that's not going to be me that it, it's going right. to happen to, and you know, you just just wait. You right? <laughs> like you'll you'll start to see. You know, it, it's just like the surveillance thing. Like oh, um, you know, when that's right, I don't have to bushes, worry, right? I don't have to I don't worry, have to worry, I'm worry not about doing... that. Or why yeah. you only have to worry if you've done something wrong. Right now, do you know anybody who doesn't think that they're they're conversations are being right. cataloged by the NSA or that if they have the wrong person in their, in their, um, you know, uh, contacts list that they're, that they're not being, you know, occasionally listened to. Uh, I mean, I think most people, most people have the expectation that they're being surveilled on some level um, now and what, whether it's just electronically or algorithmically or, or, or whatever. Right. And they didn't believe that before. They didn't care before. I mean, if you remember, there was a huge fight at one point um, because people didn't like the even the idea of the government looking up their their library records. Remember that? Mm -hmm. That was the that was the beginning of the Patriot Act debate. Right. I remember Bernie being going going to the hill about that. You know, we can't let that happen, right? I mean, just imagine the stuff they do that's so many leagues worse than that now. Right. And, yeah. and people just don't even think to protest about it because right. they've been beaten down so much. And this is just another one of those moments where it's just like, we're going to look back at this 10 years from now and be like, oh, yeah, man, maybe we should have said something back then. Like, yep. gosh. Maybe we should have said something when we had our stuff looked through when we were like visited him in the embassy, right? As happened to journalists at the Washington Post. Oh, well, the Washington Post. I mean, please, God, those are the people. No, and I'm not going to nope. say it. No, I'm what? Those are the people. No. What? Those are the people who should be sent to bear to. The, no, the, the hungry bears. Well, yeah, I, something like that. Yes, yeah. Well, what were you going to say? Those are the people who. This is those a safe are the people space. who. 
I know it's not a safe space. It's live. I, I, I can't. I can't say this. So anyway, all right. Can you modify it? Maybe like a a lighter version of it. Let, let's just say those are the people who should be who should be having suicidal thoughts. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I just can't anymore. Anyway, uh, all right. Well, uh, on that happy note, thanks for tuning into this special edition of Useful Idiots. We have to debrief. And, uh, congratulations on that. Uh, thanks to everybody who listened to the yes. uh, Nils Melzer uh, yes. episode. Free Assange. Uh, free Assange. Free Assange. Read the book. Read the book. And, we'll be back on Monday, um, right? We'll, we'll be back for Monday morning and this week. That's right. Yes. We'll see yeah. you on Monday morning. Yeah. All right. Subscribe. Bye, everyone. And you're really, Matt, you go. I'm going to tell the audience something really quickly. Okay. All right. So, guys, if you're watching this live, this is so exciting because you've got to uh, see uh, this whole thing. But if you're not watching this live, you're going to want to become Substack subscribers um, because there's going to be, what are we going to give them, Wilson? What do they get if they're Substack subscribers? They're going to get what? An exclusive conversation where Matt details his Joe Rogan experience. Yes. Right. And a little Katie Halper dad appearance. Right. Which is possibly more important. Yeah. Definitely more important. Yeah. Will he find his shoes? Tune That's in. true. We're going to have to do an, an update <laughs> next week. Yeah. Yeah. So, and obviously, to do that, you just go to usefulidiots.substack.com and Useful also. And make sure you subscribe to this channel so you see all these videos that we put out. So you press subscribe and then you press the bell. And thanks, Wilson. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Free Assange, free Assange, free Assange, free Assange. And see you on Monday. Bye, everyone. See you Monday.